Okay, should be good now. Okay, so as Helen has briefly already introduced us, my name is Katie. I'm a sustainability advisor here at the Chamber. So I've been, I'm a graduate in environmental consultancy and I've been working along some SMEs, um, helping them along their sustainability journey. And then we've partnered with Darren. Hi, I'm Darren Peck from uh, Recreveda. So um, yeah, I've been working in sustainable construction uh, and project management for the last eight years and recently set up my consultancy company, which is Recreveda, and the three tenets of the consultancy are sustainability, well-being, and personal development. So that ranges in different services which we can provide. One of them being um, sort of sustainability consultancy through sort of uh, retrofitting of your building to carbon life cycle to um, awareness training. Um, so obviously, as part of uh, my partnership with Devon and, and Cornwall Chamber of um, Devon and Plymouth Chamber of Commerce. Uh, that's why we're putting on these sessions free um, with the hope that we can give people and organisations um, the skills to be able to do their own carbon um, carbon calculating and their own carbon um, deliver on their carbon net zero journey. But if you do still need support, then that is something that as a as a consultancy we can we can provide. So. Um, yeah, so that's that's a bit about myself and a bit about Katie. So without further ado, we'll uh, we'll get kicked off. Um, we'll take questions uh, at the end if that's okay, just because obviously we're conscious of time and want to get through as much content as we as we can. Um, and yeah, so I'll hand over to, to Katie now for the intro. Okay, so yeah, as Helen said, this is the first of our four workshop series. So in the session today will be all around the background basics of carbon. We'll be introducing you to what carbon emissions are, what climate change is, sort of unpacking some of that jargon for you. And then next session on the 17th of March, we'll be covering carbon policy. So what that is, why you might need one, and our tips and tricks to make that the best it can be. And then from, from that, we'll be building up on that and we're looking more detailed into the carbon reduction strategy. So looking at how you set your strategy, how you tackle some of the data, um, looking at, at calculating your uh, carbon footprint in your uh, scope one, two, and hopefully free emissions. Um, it's quite a complex topic, but we're hoping that we can do that in that session. And then beyond, uh, beyond that, the next session will focus on actually how you start to deliver on that strategy and what you can do to, to keep the momentum, how you can engage your workforce, and then any follow on support that you might need for that. Okay, so to kick us off, we're going to ask you a question, get you involved. <laughs> so, um, if anyone's not familiar with Mentimeter, um, there's a the website's at the bottom of the screen. You can click on that or, or go on to www.menti.com, search to put that in your search bar. Um, you can do that on your phone as well. And the code is there at the bottom. So um, how confident do you feel at the start of this session with regards to your knowledge on both climate change and carbon net zero? So um, yeah, we just wanted to get a flavor of, of what the room is and how um, people might be in terms of their confidence levels for net zero and that's a big topic at the moment and obviously that's why a lot of you have joined today to understand it better so just wanted to see where we're at so maybe we can target that into our sort of follow-on sessions so um yeah we've got a say menti.com uh, and then you can all vote on that and then um we'll just see generally where the room is at essentially Just while we're waiting for people to build, is is uh is the sound okay? Maybe if anyone um can just comment in the chat. Is it, oh, we've is got it... we've got thumbs up there. We've got thumbs <laughs> up. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah. So Right, so we're about middle ground at the moment. Um, so five out of 10, which is probably good. Hopefully we can maybe edge that up to maybe a seven by the end of this session. That'll be, uh, that'll be good. Right, yeah, so we'll, okay. we'll carry on. That's, that's good that we've got a, a good general level. Um, hopefully no one voted one, no one voted 10. 
<laughs> Hopefully it was all around the five mark. So yeah, we'll carry on then. Okay, so although you do seem like you've already got a bit of knowledge, I'll just start from the very basics of climate change. So climate change is defined as the long-term shift in weather patterns, primarily driven by human activities, reducing greenhouse gases. And the most common of these is carbon, which you've already had carbon dioxide. And I've just got a little video to just explain a little bit more about that. <laughs> as the sun's rays reach the Earth's surface, some are absorbed and re-emitted as heat. Greenhouse gases, such as water vapor and carbon dioxide, absorb and re-radiate some of this heat. Increased amounts of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere mean more heat is trapped, warming the Earth. Human activities, especially the burning of fossil fuels, have increased concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide by 40%, mainly since 1900. Global average surface temperature has increased by 0.8 degrees Celsius over that time. Other changes to the climate in recent decades can be seen in the warming of the oceans, a rise in sea level, decreasing snow and ice cover in the Northern Hemisphere, and a decline in sea ice in the Arctic. If emissions continue unchecked, then further warming of 2.6 to 4.8 degrees Celsius would be expected by the end of this century. Even at the low end, this would have serious implications for human societies and the natural world. Okay, so you may have seen the stripes on this picture here. They were done by the University of Reading, and it shows the global temperature change from 1850 to 2021. So you can see, obviously, we are in that red area now. Um, and the seven warmest years on record have all been since 2015, with global temperatures increasing by around one degree C in the last century. And as you, the video already said, Antarctica has lost an annual average of 148 billion tonnes of ice in the last 30 years. Climate change also brings with it an increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, such as heat waves, droughts, heavy rainfall, storms and floods, which Plymouth and the Southwest will be definitely feeling that, that wetter weather over the next few years. Okay, so what does this sort of mean in a global context? So um, obviously a lot of uh, media attention on the recent sort of COP26 uh, up in Glasgow this year. And uh, last year, sorry. And um, yeah, so what, why did it all begin and, and what's it sort of all about? So essentially the, the global sort of scientific community has been aware of our effect on the climate over sort of quite some years now. Uh, and generally the um, sort of climate convention started around the early sort of 1990s with um, sort of climate science developing quite well there. Um, and yeah, there's been a lot of conventions around carbon, um, climate change and the effect of greenhouse gases, particularly sort of carbon, methane, um, and we'll touch on more of those later um, since that period. But it's only really in the last sort of um, 10 or so years that it started to actually really progress in terms of the science and people taking action against climate change. So obviously the um, Paris Agreement in 2015, set out the uh, target emissions, um, sorry, the tar target global warming amount at 1.5 degrees, because that was assessed at the uh, realistic target for us to limit our, our increase in global temperature by 1.5 degrees by, um, by the end of the century, so by 2100. And um, the, the rationale behind that was that that would actually have a, uh, an effect that would enable us to, to mitigate the negative effects like Katie was referring to on global ice stores, on sort of um, seasonal storms and, and the negative benefit and uh, the negative effects of climate change on the global community. So as uh, say COP26, um, we had um, good buy-in from a lot of the um, countries. So um, particularly noteworthy were China and, and the US who ratified that agreement. So essentially they committed to um, combating climate change and, and focusing on their carbon, carbon emissions. So that was a, 
that was a, a big win for the sort of scientific community. So now, um, obviously, we, we're then seeing lots of different either governments or local authorities or companies committing to their net zero by 2030, 2040, 2050. And obviously, we'll go into more detail about the, the particulars of what net zero is and, and about that as we go through these, this slide pack. So obviously that's the global context. So to stay in line with the, the temperature incre increase of 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, we require a 50% reduction in emissions between 2018 and 2030. So, um, and that is focused around science-based targets, which is critical. And again, we'll talk, talk more about science-based targets, but it is very empirical and it's very scientific in the way it's, it's approached. So that is, um, yeah, that gives it strength in terms of you can actually measure these things quite scientifically now. Okay, so the so the carbon footprint. So what is um, what is your carbon footprint? So a lot of people talk about footprints. Um, it's generally a visual way of, of describing like what your impact is upon the um, the environment. So there are obviously other elements of footprinting. So your uh, impact on water, the environment, um, the natural capital, but the carbon footprint obviously relates to the amount of carbon dioxide emissions which are released as a result of your organisation or your country or whatever sort of reporting population that you are in. So that's how how much carbon dioxide is released from fossil fuels into the into the environment as a result of your operations. So that gives you a bit more of a background about about what um, sort of carbon dioxide is and how it's sort of generated. So essentially uh, any of the sort of non-renewables, so the fossil fuels like coal, oil, or gas, if you use those to generate energy or um, for other uses, um, that then produces carbon dioxide, which is released into the atmosphere. Uh, and generally when people talk about sort of um, carbon net zero, Carbon um, is used as the baseline. So if you can see on the table here, there are a few, few other um, global warming emitting gases uh, and you can see them on the screen. And to, to make that easy to, um, to convey and easy to monitor and track and report against. So carbon dioxide is given the baseline of one. So anything in that table is related back to its effect relative to um, carbon dioxide. So if you take into account, for example, methane, it's it's global warming potential as a as a as when um, conveyed against carbon dioxide, it's got 28 times more potential to impact the, the global warming of the atmosphere. So in terms of the the insulating effect that it gives in terms of the um, greenhouse gas effect, uh, sorry, the greenhouse effect that it gives is um, 28 times more for the same constituent amount. So it's a lot more potent as a gas. And then if you look further down the, um, down the, down the table here, so some of your um, sort of sulfur hexafluorides and things like that, they have such a bigger effect in terms of their global warm potential. So obviously we want to regulate those as, um, as a lot more stringently than, than some of the others. Um, but to say the carbon is always used as the baseline. It's, it's a baseline over a hundred years because they have, different half-lives in terms of the, the, the rate of decay of those gases. So it's always measured as a baseline from carbon dioxide over a hundred year period. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of talk in the sort of scientific community over the sort of the greenhouse gas effect and sort of ozone depletion. But now with the, the focus is more on carbon dioxide and how those, those gases have the effect on the, a warming effect on the environment, which is obviously a lot of those those fossil fuels which we have been using for maybe sort of post-industrial times are the ones which are having the biggest effect on on the global climate in a, in a short time span okay so yeah i mean as you've seen from that it's a lot of complexity within the different gases so they are reported as a carbon dioxide equivalent as darren said based on that one year and they're also, when you're reporting and recording emissions, they're split into three different scopes, which you may or may not be familiar with. Um, so there's no current requirements for SMEs to report a record for any of these scopes, but for larger organisations, scope one and two 
they have to set reduction targets. And scope three, there's less stringent, but it's still there, which is scope one and two are definitely the easiest to calculate and the easiest to record. Whereas scope three is a lot more complex, but it also accounts for the largest proportion of emissions for most organizations. So we'll just go into them in a little bit more detail. So scope one emissions are emissions that are directly under your control. So that's on-site fuel combustion. So if you've got a gas boiler, in your, if you're either in an owned premises or a lease premises where you control your tariff, you control your gas bills, then that counts as that. If you have any company owned vehicles, that doesn't include business travel on vehicles that might be personal. And any losses from refrigerants when your uh, fridges are topped up and serviced, any that will be included in scope one as well. So this is one of the more basic ones to calculate. And then we've also got scope two, which is potentially the easiest one. So that is indirect emissions from the energy that you purchase and consume on site. So for that, you're looking at your electricity bills, really. So then it does delve into the more complex and we've got scope three. OK, so scope three essentially is anything from your value chain, your supply chain. So any um, emissions that are generated uh, as a consequence of your business activities, but you're not directly in control of, or you don't have any influence over. So uh, there are 15 different categories for this, and you can see on the screen that some of them, and we talked about um, earlier in the, in the session. So for example, business travel would be in this category, um, as well as you've got a split here. So bear with me, this is the most com complicated part. So with your scope free emissions, they are indirect emissions. So they are, uh, say, as a result of your business operations, but not related to those you directly control. And of that, you've got two sequences. So you've got the upstream activities. So anything before you sort of get to your business operation and then those after it leaves your business operation. So for example, um, if you're a company which fabricate, fabricates uh, glazing, for example, so glazing of facades, um if you if you um take all of the constituent parts of that glazing paddle so so a window essentially if you might have um rubber seals as part of that finished product which your business puts together but that the um the scope emissions from that that rubber will not be included in your um activity but it will be um part of your product essentially so then when you get to the end of life of that product that you provide, that will, the waste from that product will be, uh, should be counted in your scope free emissions, essentially, even though you don't have any um, impact or control over it once that is actually passed down the line to uh, a building owner or operator or things like that. So that is why sort of scope free emissions have generally always been um, neglected because they are quite complicated to, um, to, to calculate and also the fact of there's a hesit hesitancy to do so because there is a lot of sort of maybe double counting which goes on with scope free emissions because yeah if um for example who would uh, who would count the transport emissions for example from when the different ownerships of the different vehicles for example if you're if you're at Amazon, for example, um, obviously other providers do do uh, do operate. But if you had a fleet of vehicles that were owned by yourself, that would be in the scope one emission. But if you had maybe a self-employed driver who had their own vehicle, that wouldn't actually be classed within your scope one emissions. That would be classed in the scope three emissions. So it's there's a lots of levels levels of complexity when you dig down into actual operate in live businesses which have a big uh, supply chain and lots of different constituent parts um, again i don't want to labor this point but essentially um, if you have your own um, your own office for example and you 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 own that building the scope one emissions would be counted counted in the scope one sorry but then if you um, if you actually lease that building uh, and you don't have um, you don't have control over your energy bills, for example. So if you're in a landlord occupied space and maybe you're in a 
um, you're in a office building which has multiple levels, the um, the landlord may control that energy bill, so you don't actually have, have control over that. So that's why that would sit in the in the scope three emissions as opposed to being in your scope one. So that's why there's a lots of crossover between the different scopes depending on your operational environment, where you're located, and how your business operates. So um, apologies if that came across at all, but it is quite a complicated picture. There are lots of different simple um, diagrams which you can send out after this pack. We wanted to just try and keep it as simple as possible on the screen for today, and then we'll issue a sort of support pack of information. And obviously, if you still want to clarify anything in the questions at the end, then, then feel free to do so. Okay, so um, are SMEs too small to make a difference? So 99% of UK businesses are SMEs. Uh, it counts for around 70 to 80% of chamber members if you are a member of the Devon and Cornwall, Devon and Plymouth Chamber of Commerce, I always say that. Um, yeah, so um, essentially you are a big part of the, the carbon sort of challenge or the carbon um, and also a big part of the carbon solution. So I say around half of UK business um, are generated by SMEs. So it is a big part of the of the pie, so to speak. Um, so yeah, it is um, it is worthwhile you going through the exercise of sort of plotting and and um, challenging clim climate um, carbon in your in your business operation and your supply chain. Okay, so moving on to the big <laughs> question, what is net zero? So there are a lot of climate terms that are bundled about and they can be quite complex. And I think so sometimes it's used so widely, but maybe there's not actually that clear what it is. So net zero is defined as where the amount of greenhouse gas emissions released as a result of your activities are balanced within those removed. But the key part of net zero is that you're reducing emissions as much as possible and then you're either offsetting or um, carbon capturing the rest, any remainders. And uh, the SME Climate Hub suggests that for net zero, um, you would want to be looking to reduce emissions by 90% and then only offset the remaining 10 in order to be classed as net zero. So it's not just about balancing. And to clear that up, so you may have heard carbon neutral. So carbon neutral is the more basic of the three terms. So carbon neutral, you don't have to reduce emissions. Carbon neutral is just a simple case of balancing the emissions that you do produce with offsetting. So that's been used widely in the past, but it's not actually great because <laughs> obviously we're not actually making a difference if we're just passing those emissions off. So what we're looking at at the moment is net zero, where you're looking to reduce your emissions as much as you possibly can, and if there's any residual left, then we offset. And then moving beyond net zero is net positive, where you're looking to offset more than what your residual emissions are. So hopefully that's cleared up the difference between those three terms. So in the local area, well, in the UK, the government has set a net zero target of 2050. And Devon County Council have also aligned with this 2050 target, although the council themselves are looking at a 2030 target. And then Plymouth has gone a little bit earlier, and Plymouth has set a target for the entire city to be net zero by 2030, which is maybe ambitious, but we'll have to see what we're looking at in the next eight years. So we're back on to Menti. Um, so we just wanted to get a flavour of, of, of why you've may potentially join this session and, and why you are looking to reduce your um, sort of carbon of your business or, or operations um, if you are representing business today. I know we've got a few people just more for, for knowledge, which is which is fine. Um, so yeah, um, if you could all do the same again and, and go on to Menti and then have a little vote and see where we're at on that one. Is that open? That's open now, I believe. I think it we can vote on that now. Which is good.
Uh, sorry, I didn't realise. I thought it was a, a vote thing, but it's actually you submit your answer. So yeah, if you can submit that in the chat box or on Minty. Um, just just wanted to get an understanding of, of what people's drivers are on the call. Um, is, is corporate goals, is that pressure from your organisation or is that what your organisation is looking to do? Is sort of your group looking to pressure or I don't know whose question that is. <laughs> I think we've got a few flavour of answers there. If anyone's put a few more in, hopefully it'll come up on, on the screen. Um, okay. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, some, yeah, some, um, some different answers in there, which is good. Okay, so, yeah, that was essentially just to get a bit of flavor of what everyone focus was so why act so i've been working sort of corporate social uh, corporate sustainability now for for around eight years and it's increasingly becoming more and more of a driver of big businesses to act in a corporate socially responsible way so um when i worked at mace and mace are a, a large sort of tier one contractor construction company on some big projects like the Tottenham stadium uh the shard Tate Modern, uh, a few of the other sort of big ones in London and, and around the world, a third of their clients would cho choose them specifically on the sustainability targets. And when I left the last year, it was the biggest key search in terms of the company website, both internally and externally, and the most well attended event in terms of any sort of training or corporate events that we, we put on. The sustainability focused ones were always the highest. So, um, that's sort of one element of, of why you would do so um, to make sort of remain competitive in the, in the marketplace. So moving on to other factors and other drivers, obviously we're all hopefully uh, on the call to, uh, located in the Southwest, predominantly sort of Devon, um, maybe some Cornwall um, and um, obviously we're in, we're in Plymouth, Kate and I. Um, so attracting talent is, is a very, very big driver now for businesses, a very big consideration. There's obviously a war on talent in most industries um, and getting good quality talent in the right roles is a, is a driver. And with regards to new, new people coming into the workplace, um, they're looking increasingly to work for companies which um, are co corporate, corporately responsible. So they have um, sort of key ambitions and key, clearly defined aims and objectives which benefits society. And that is a big driver now for, for staff when they consider what, what companies um, they want to work for. So, uh, and that also assists with when you're actually delivering work and, and operating as a business, then you'll have uh, better engaged staff, increased sat satisfaction scores amongst your staff. And um, yeah, generally you will retain staff as well better, which is, yeah, proven in a lot of, a lot of studies around um, staffing and resource um, in the sort of modern environment. So uh, if we move on, uh, so yeah, what are the ben business benefits of uh, addressing your sort of net zero carbon or wider sustainability targets as a business? So ob obvious one, which is quite easy to track is sort of cost savings. Um, obviously everyone's aware of the rising energy costs which are coming up, um, they're looming. There's also um, a levy on, on diesel is, um, being um, being abolished, so that that diesel costs are going to go up. Um, obviously, current geopolitical um, scenarios may also have effect on, you know, the availability of of sort of uh, fossil fuels emissions, uh, fossil fuel resources, and things like that. So, um, yeah, it's a very dynamic environment in terms of energy, and the less energy you can use, the more you can save, and also the better it is for the for the um, for the climate so um and yeah generally sort of future proven climate resilience that's a big part now of modern businesses obviously um you operating in in, a, in an environment this is more wider sustainability but you know um increased risk of storm events increased risk of flooding things like that they are also on the agenda now 
So any way that you can future proof your building, your operations and rely less on assets that are potentially going to be turbulent in terms of their supply is a, is a good, good driver for the business. And yeah, lastly, public image. So there are a lot now of um, organizations which rely solely or, or, or predominantly on their corporate image to sell, sell the products. One a good, good example of that would be Patagonia, for example. Um, they're a clothing brand and people choose them purely on their sort of sustainability and environment credentials. And um, so sort of the, the, the product is also sometimes like superficial now to, to the actual brand uh, because they are so dominant in the environment space and they are very well thought of in that space. People will, will pick that more on the, on the brand than on the product. Which is which is pretty impressive, really. Um, so yeah, there there's a flavour of some of the reasons why you might want to act and and the, the benefits that you may experience when you do so. Um, you're on to the next slide. Yeah. Okay. So this session has just been really to just introduce you to the topic to hopefully get you to grasp with those jargon. And so the next time we'll be looking at carbon policies what they are, what you need one, and how we can make that the best it can be. Um, I've got the link to register there. Um, we'll be posting that to you afterwards. Um, and what we'd be looking for you to bring to next session or to look in the between is for you to start looking at your scope one and two emissions. So for that, we'd like you to gather your electricity and gas bills and collect your mileage or fuel use of your company owned vehicles. And then see whether you have someone already assigned to sustainability how you can put sustainability on your agenda. And if you already have a policy in place, bring it to next session. Okay, so now we've got some time for Q&A. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. Okay, brilliant. I think we've got a few bits in the chat. So while Katie's looking at that, um, did anyone wanna field a question sort of verbally to me or to Katie? So uh, Lisa's put a scope three emissions taking into account when applying for B Corp status. So is B Corp something you've uh, looked at, Lisa? Not yet. I think we're we're way off that, but it will be something in the future that we look at. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, B Corp is is not entirely about carbon emissions. So it covers uh, five areas of the business. It it really focuses on the sustainability, uh, the social side as well. So um, the five categories are environment, workers, community, staff, and there is another one. Um, and so actually carbon emissions within that are quite a small part of the environment sector. So if you're looking for something that is solely, if you're looking for a solely uh, carbon or climate change certification, then maybe B Corp isn't the right one. But uh, yeah, it's definitely, I don't know if that's really answered your question. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I'd be interested to hear what other um, certifications you'd, you'd suggest as going for if it was more, if we're more interested in the sustainability side of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's not to say B Corp isn't useful, but like it's really, really good. Um, but yeah, just to be aware, I think sometimes B Corp is viewed as just an environmental thing, but it is a much wider scope. Um, so yeah, it is a really good certification, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, what what um, what is the nature of your business, Elisa? Sorry, I'm, I'm not familiar. It will be, we're, we're building at the moment, but we will be a, um, a, share, a shared workspace. So shared offices and co-working space. We also have a, a gym and a cafe and event okay. space. Is that a new new build or is that um, refurbishment? No, it's um it's a refurbishment of a Grade One listed building. So um, we have put put things in place to to be as sustainable as possible. But we know there's a lot of work that we can do, and of course we're going to have you know over a hundred people working in in the building on a daily basis. So like I said in the chat before, we have a kind of um, a platform to be able to encourage other businesses to be as sustainable as possible as well. Okay, so yeah, I mean, there'll be two elements to that. There'll be the in construction phase of, of your sort of carbon emissions and the embodied carbon of the materials that are going into that, that refurbishment, which is principally what I do day to day. And then there'll be the follow on in terms of over the life cycle, which is around 80% of the overall carbon emissions from a, from a um, building, because obviously it's based over the lifespan of 
maybe 120 years of, of operation of a building or 60 years, depending on what, what space it is. Um, that'll be a lot more people focused. And the biggest driver of that is actually how you operate a building. So even though you can do sort of sensors and controls and, and all of these sorts of things, there's also elements, for example, with thermal comfort where people like to have control over that. So they'll override the preset systems to open a window, even though it might be ventilated or um, people will like to feel the warming effect of the heating coming on. So there'll be sort of complaints to build, building management, for example, saying it's too cold and then someone else will go down and say, oh, it's too warm because there's a lot of perception around that. So without laboring that point, uh, I think in construction, probably be green, but they'll probably advise you to, to go through a green building certification scheme. Uh, and then, yeah, looking at um, some of the other systems or, or monitoring tools that you have uh, or building regulation in terms of your sort of mechanical electrical uh, plant that you have in the building. Um, so setting it up for success at the start. Um, but yeah, elements of that will be will, will, will probably require you to do scope, scope one, two and three emissions and, and calculate that through the life cycle of the building. So it's, it's quite complicated, but yeah, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot of scope to, to challenge that, especially in a refer, which obviously better than new build in terms of its carbon emissions. But yeah, maybe we can pick that up after or um, yeah. Is there any other questions then? Uh, so we've got one from Greg. Um, we have an EPD for our product, but are looking to compare it with those of our competitors. Is GWP a standard summary of the footprint of the product? What products are you looking at, Greg? Paint. It's an environmentally friendly paint that's got a whole load of qualities. Um, and trying to compare the EPD of, of, the, of the big boys, the Dulux, the Trans, and, and others, so we can calculate that if a customer was to swap from heavily paying to us, the difference is S times square meters of a project equals different in um, of a warming potential, but the, uh, the whole load of criteria on an EP. So it's the easiest one to use global warming potential. Yeah, because the complex things to understand in these statements. You were a little bit punctuated there on, yeah. on the old uh, sound, but essentially, yeah, you, if you've got the EPD um, and, and yeah, I mean, there are obviously lots of factors which come into the materiality of a product. Um, mm. obviously carbon is one element of that. Um, if you're looking at paints, for example, you're going to be looking at VOCs. Is it a low VOC mm. product in terms of grams per litre? Um, okay, yeah. Is it water-based, which majority yep. of paints obviously are nowadays? So there's lots of different elements. Um, yeah. I mean, this session obviously focus on carbon uh, and the sort of grams of carbon, maybe per liter of of your paint would be a good yeah. factor to to base that upon. But then, if you're looking at the whole wider environmental impact of your product and and trying mm -hmm. to find that USP for that, um, there's lots of other elements which you could potentially target which might be a better way to market that product in terms of its green credentials rather than, than just the, just the carbon i'm not trivializing the carbon but there are as I say there are other avenues which you might do particularly when you're looking towards specs for um big big contractors and things like that there'll, there'll be other elements so yeah again uh, happy to talk about that offline if, if you would like to okay yes please I, i'd well thank you yeah, there are a lot of a lot of complexities when looking at this. Uh, no worries, Lisa. Uh, just while we're finding see you next that, session. <laughs> just while we're finding that, we will share the slide pack. We'll probably be um, reduced with some of our prompts out of it, um, and then we will share the recording as well, so people can look at that online. Um, happy to do that. Mm -hmm. We've got any other questions? Uh, reading online about embodied carbon and the carbon release from building materials. So um, we've got some resources on the next slide, which we'll. Um, share around to you afterwards as well which contains some more sort of general reading um so i think that would be yeah essentially embodied carbon um yeah it's a it's a big part of it uh it's a big part so um if we're looking at bodied carbon of a building for example uh around two-thirds of that is the substructure and superstructure and then of that um you've got around 75 percent includes pre uh precast uh, concrete, in situ concrete and still. So those are the big elements. 
uh, if maybe Greg was looking at uh, in terms of uh, fittings and furnishings um, and decorating, that would be about 14% of a building. And that's from like UK Green Building Council. But essentially, um, if a product doesn't have an EPD, so environmental product decoration, which sets out all of its environmental credentials, there are other elements that you can look into to, to find that information. Might be a little bit harder, but uh, a lot more suppliers now are getting a lot more accustomed to those questions being asked which is, is a good thing because then, yeah, they have the they have the stock answer rather than having to find that themselves. But um, yeah, essentially the, the carbon, um, the, the embodied carbon of products now will be increasingly put into product date sheets and, and specs and things like that. So it is becoming easier to find, but it's still some of the more obscure sort of products might not have them. So uh, yeah. We can talk about embodied carbon maybe in, in, in the next session or the one after that when we're talking about uh, calculating your your um your carbon from your from your business. Uh, that was all the questions in the chat. Um okay. is there anything else anyone's got or I'd like to yeah? No? Okay. Um I don't think, do you have anything else you'd like to say? Yeah? No, I say, I say it's, it's quite a complicated topic, um, particularly when you're looking at the supply chain and the scope free element of it. Um, I say, don't be perturbed from that. Um, say, go away if you are looking to come on the 17th of March, um, just before you get your St. Patrick's Day drinks in. Um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be here and we can, we can give you some more knowledge. I say, the, the intention of these sessions was to start off small and build. And um, obviously, we'll send some links. We'll send out the slide packs so you can go back through that if, if you want to. Uh, and if you can come with sort of some information about your organization, um, and then and sort of we'll build on that. And then it, you'll get a lot more out of the session if you do do so. And we'll, we'll probably have next session, it will be a bit more workshop based. Yeah, this is a bit more of us talking at you. Um, we appreciate that. But next one will be a bit more participation. And hopefully, if we have sort of similar numbers, everyone will be able to ask their specific questions and we'll, and we'll do that in a bit more of a punctuated style so people can ask questions as they go through. So um, yeah, one more one more call for questions. No? Okay, well. Okay, well, we'll send you everything and yeah, make sure you register for our next session and then otherwise we'll see you on the 17th of March, but we're both available to contact in between if you've got any questions, if you want to get a head start. So, yeah, just keep in touch. Okay. Brilliant. All right. Thank you. The session to a close. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much.